Welcome to MEB. This is Episode 6, Pressure Concepts and Manometers. As you've surely learned previously, pressure is defined to be a force exerted over an area. Pressure is isotropic, meaning it acts in every direction at the same time. A fluid under pressure in a vessel or pipe exerts a force on the walls of its container. If the container is not rigid, like this balloon, the boundaries of the container will move outward in all directions equally. If the container is rigid, however, like a car tire, the walls of the container will exert an equal and opposite force onto the fluid inside. This is a short video clip of me measuring the pressure inside my car tire. The air inside the tire exerts a pressure to move the sliding end. As I told you in episode 4, in the United States we love PSI, or pounds per square inch, as the unit to measure pressure. Look, my tire is perfectly inflated to about 33 PSI. Interestingly though, this value is not the true value of the pressure inside the tire. Since the atmosphere is a fluid also, it exerts a pressure in all directions as well. So, while the tire pressure pushes the sliding end outwards, the atmosphere works to push the sliding end inwards. If we performed a force balance on this situation, we would define the outward direction to be positive, and say that the reading of the tire pressure gauge, also known as the gauge pressure, is equal to the true pressure inside the tire, also known as the absolute pressure, minus the atmospheric pressure. By rearranging this equation, we get absolute pressure equals gauge pressure plus atmospheric pressure. For my car tire, because atmospheric pressure is 14.7 psi, the true pressure inside is 47.7 psi. Make a special mental note here. An overwhelming majority of the time in engineering, when you need to use pressure in an equation, you'll need the absolute pressure. The only time you wouldn't is if you're using an empirical correlation, which means coming from an experiment as opposed to theory. That is based on gauge pressure. So whenever you see pressure in a problem, get in the habit of asking yourself whether this is gauge pressure or absolute pressure, and then add atmospheric pressure if it is appropriate. Another important pressure concept for chemical engineers is hydrostatic pressure, which is exerted by a column of fluid. Hydrostatic pressure explains why your ears hurt unless you pop them when you dive somewhat deeply into a body of water. The equation for hydrostatic pressure is rho, the fluid density, times g, the acceleration due to gravity, times h, the depth into the body of water. Plus, because atmospheric pressure is at play too, we add that to the equation. A pressure measurement device that makes use of the concept of hydrostatic pressure is called a manometer. This is a U-shaped tube with a dense fluid in the bottom of it. A difference in pressure will cause the fluid to be different levels on the two sides. In order to solve for one of the pressures, or the difference in pressure, we can apply a pressure balance. Let's start with the left side, where it looks like the manometer is open to the atmosphere on the left, so we have P-atmosphere. Then, a column of air. I am going to define D1 as the distance from the top of the fluid on the right side to the top of the manometer. This is the blue arrow. Then I'll define D2 as the distance from the top of the fluid on the left and the fluid on the right. This is the white arrow. Therefore, the total height of air on the left side is D1 plus D2. On the right side, we have an applied pressure, which would be the variable we want to solve for. We also have a column of air on the right side with a height of D1. We also have a column of dark liquid on the right with a height of D2. Note that if multiple immiscible fluids are stacked on top of one another, the hydrostatic pressures are additive. We can simplify this equation by canceling rho air G D1, since it is the same on both sides. If you're really paying attention, you might have wondered why I didn't count the little column of dark liquid on the left when I was deriving the equation. But you can prove that this will cancel, similar to why the air term cancels. Now we can rearrange the equation. In some cases, we want to define delta P to be the difference between the pressures on the two sides. So, bringing those terms to one side and the hydrostatic pressures to the other, we come up with this expression. Taking it one step further, if the densities are different by orders of magnitude, we can neglect the small ones. In this case, air only has a density of about 1 kilogram per meter cubed. We don't know what the liquid is in this example, but we can say for sure that the density of any liquid is much greater than 1 kilogram per meter cubed. Therefore, we can simply neglect the density of air. Let's try a short example problem which will hopefully clarify this. Let's say we wanted to determine the gauge pressure on the left side of this manometer in pascals using dimensions and properties as shown on this diagram. It looks like we have two fluids to deal with which are immiscible, a blue fluid and a green fluid. 
I should also mention here that density is sometimes reported in terms of specific gravity, or SG for short, where the density of the fluid is divided by the density of water, which acts as a reference. This is done to make the quantity dimensionless. So if we wanted our densities in kilograms per meter cubed, which we will if we're calculating the pressure in pascals, we should multiply these specific gravities by a thousand, which is the density of water in kilograms per meter cubed. So let's sum the pressures on the left. We have P left, as the diagram says, and then a column of air, a column of green fluid, and a column of blue fluid. Notice that I've defined my distances by assigning each one a numbered subscript. On the right, we'll have atmospheric pressure, a column of air, and a column of blue fluid. Rearranging the equation, I get P left minus P atmosphere on one side of the equation. Note that this is literally the gauge pressure on the left that we are asked to solve. All that's left to do is to figure out the heights, given the dimensions on the diagram, plug numbers in, and calculate. Pay careful attention to my units. I'm putting densities in kilograms per meter cubed, G is in meters per second squared, and I'm leaving the heights in meters. This combination of units yields pascals, which is worth convincing yourself if you're not sure. Performing the calculation, I find that the gauge pressure is 1,137 pascals. Although this number seems large, bear in mind that this is only about 1% of atmospheric pressure. This is a major benefit of manometers. They can be very precise at measuring small pressure drops. Episode 6 Learning Objectives Now that this episode is over, you should be able to 1. Explain the general concept of pressure, including the difference between gauge pressure and absolute pressure. 2. Recall and use the equation for hydrostatic pressure to relate pressure, depth, and density of a fluid. 3. Derive and solve a force balance as applied to a manometer. And that will conclude this episode. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.